It's really lovely to see each one of you join us this morning for our morning worship. I don't know what kind of week you've had. It's been good that the sun's been out a little bit more this week, and uh, at least compared to the last few months. And looking forward to the spring and some perhaps some brighter days ahead. But it's good to know that we stand on some unshakable truths this morning as God's people. I want to read to you some words from Psalm 62, just a couple of short passages from that psalm. The first two verses, the opening two verses of Psalm 62 say this. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. And the psalmist goes to speak about his uh, enemies a bit and what they're doing to him. And he returns to God. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation, he is my fortress, I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God, he is a mighty rock, my refuge, I will trust him at all times. Pour out your hearts to him, you people, for God is our refuge. We're going to sing two songs to begin our time of praise and worship. This morning we're going to stay seated as we hear a song sung to us. From Psalm 62, based on those words, and then the musicians will lead us in prayer. They will stand together to sing our second song in describe.
this morning. We thank you that we meet in the presence of of a God who, as we've just sung, is our salvation and our fortress and our rock, and that because of that, that we will never be shaken. And we ask for all, for those who gather this morning, <coughs> both here in this building and also those watching at home, we know, Lord, there are many going through difficult and tough times at the moment. And we ask, Lord, that you will draw close to, uh, to those people and help them to know that, as we have just read and as we have just sung, that they can cling to you. Because you are always there and you love them so much. You want to be with them and be help and help them at this time. And I pray, Lord, as we meet together this morning, we will know that we have been in your presence. And that you have uh, come alongside us in our, our struggles and also come alongside us in our joys that many will have too. So we thank you, Father God, as we come together this morning. We worship you, our living God. Amen. Chapter 2, not going to read the whole of chapter 2, 
going to read the first part of it up to verse 9 and then from verse 20 onwards because there we have the same thing said twice and that same thing we're going to look at this morning. We've looked at the middle passage when we first looked at Haggai 2 so we're not going to read that this morning. We're just going to make sure we can focus on the first and the last. So Haggai 2 and verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while... I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, declares the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. We're going to go on to verse 20. He's already spoken about everything being shaken by God. And he does it again at the end of this chapter. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. He tells Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. Then verse 23 that we looked at last week, on that day, on the day when God shakes the heavens and the earth, on that day declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Sing a song, we're going to stand together as we're led in worship by the musicians. We're going to sing These are the Days of Elijah, which speaks to some of the great events of the Old Testament, how they come to fulfillment in Jesus, including the destruction, rebuilding of the temple that uh, Haggai speaks about in this book. And so we're going to stand together as we're led in worship. Amen.
notice it's closed this morning, so I'm trying to put these um, on the website just to make you uh, uh, make sure you can uh, see what's going on. There's a calendar up on the website if you haven't seen it. Uh, been up for a couple of weeks, but uh, for the next uh, few weeks up till Easter, we've got a calendar of some of the things that are happening. Um, we have got our 4 p.m. get together. If you're able to join us on Zoom later, it's good to meet together. If you're able to pop in for a bit just to say hello and see how each other are doing. We do have the men's Bible study tomorrow at 2 p.m. If you've never been to the men's Bible study before, you'd like to come, you'd be very welcome. We're halfway through looking at the book of Obadiah, which is only a very, very short book, the shortest book in the Old Testament. And uh, if you'd like to come along, at 2 p.m., then, uh, then do let me know. I'll give you the details so you can join us on Zoom, but um, it's different to our church Zoom details. It's hosted by another church, and a few different Christians from different churches come together and we study um, God's Word. So... That's 2 p.m. tomorrow if you're able to join us for that for the men. On Thursday, we've been having our rebuilding uh, uh, sessions, our rebuilding evenings, talking about rebuilding different areas of life. We've had rebuilding manhood and womanhood, and this week we've got rebuilding our witness. And so our witness is um, communicating what Jesus has done to us, to other people. Um, communicating that to the world around us is something that's been really hard to do over the past 12 months as a church and individually being stuck at home and with things being closed and with us not being able to meet together as we would like. And so it's good to think about how we can rebuild that. Half seven this Thursday, we'll have just a time together to think about that. And let me just let you know about some of the Easter plans that we've got uh, coming up. Um, if you remember, during Advent, in the lead up to Christmas, we had a couple of weeks, wasn't it, of, um, of a little devotion each day, just five or ten minutes, sometimes in the morning, sometimes at lunchtime, sometimes in the evening, um, where we could reflect on the birth of Jesus and the impact that that has on us. Well, we're going to do a similar thing for Easter, on what is called the, the, the Passion Week, the week leading up to Good Friday, where we remember the death of Jesus and Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. We are going to have devotions each day as we think about the words Jesus spoke from the cross. And so we'll get some details out as we get closer to the time, but we'll have some in the morning and some in the middle of the day, some in the evening, to help us think about the importance of Easter and reflect as we lead up to that uh, momentous celebration. And uh, as we did at Christmas, as we had our car park service, you remember our praise and worship, our carol service out in the car park, the people could come and we could uh, sit together in, in the cold um, on, uh, East, uh, on Christmas. Well, we're going to have a similar thing for Easter and uh, hopefully the weather will be a lot warmer so we can sit in our cars or we can sit outside our cars uh, in the car park and have a time of praise and worship celebrating that Jesus is alive on Easter Sunday. And again, we'll give you more details as we get close to that, but I just want to let you know that that is going to happen on Easter Sunday outside in the car park so that we can all raise our voices and sing together in praise of our Saviour. I'm going to pray and uh, then we've got, uh, I'm going to play you a kids song that we've been learning at Kids Club and I'm going to see if any of the children who are part of Kids Club who've been able to join us for our Kids Club meetings want to come and show us some of the actions that we've tried to learn for that. So I'll pray and then we're going to have this video. Let's pray for some of those things. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can make plans that we can plan to praise you better, we can plan to be better witnesses for you, we can plan to uh, give you all the honour and praise and glory, but we recognise, Lord, that we have no control over the future, that our plans will only happen in accordance with your will. And so, Lord, we want to say, Lord, if, if you're willing to allow us to do these things, then we submit them to you, into your hands, your mighty hands, and your outstretched arms that can do far more than we could possibly imagine or expect with the things that we plan in your name. So Lord, we pray that we never plan to do these things in our own strength, or for our own personal desires or motivations, but only to bring all the glory and praise to God. Amen. Right, we're going to have this video. It's from Psalm 95. So we did, um, we were thinking about the Psalms with the children. Psalm 95, if you want to have it open in front of you, you can see some of the words you're about to sing together. And um, Psalm 95 is the first, uh, at least the first four verses. There's four verses of Psalm 95. And we try to come to some actions. 
But there's a lot of words to this, and therefore a lot of action. So I wonder if any of the children were brave enough to come up the front and try and remember some of the actions. And you, there were quite a lot that we tried to learn on Friday, and so you'll probably forget some of them, and that's okay, nobody really minds. Is anybody brave enough to come forward? And uh, Stephanie, you would? And Victoria would? That would be brilliant. Do you want to come out? And Precious, do you want to as well? I think you can remember some. Brilliant. Well, as they were, Stephanie, you stand at the front here. That's great. And then Victoria, Precious, you can stand over here. And um, so there were a lot of actions. Um, but if we want to stand together as this video plays, then we can try and follow Precious and Victoria and Stephanie, and they'll lead us in these. And um, they may not be able to remember them, all of them, on, on the spot. And you may have to look behind you and see some of the words. I don't know if they'll come up on the screens for you there. But um, uh, we'll give it our best shot and we'll see what happens. And we'll all stand together and, uh, so we can uh, worship God through the words of this song. teach you some things about some of the big words in the Bible that we find hard to understand. Now, I just say to the children and to the parents as well that we do have a number of activity packs that have been provided for us by the community garden where Steve serves just down the road on a, on 
uh, Bath Street to Bath Road there. And um, I don't know if we have an activity pack for every child in the family because they were um, in demand, but we have a number of them. And so we can at least have one for each family. And if we've got a number of children in the family, particularly older children, um, that it'd be suitable for, then you can have multiple packs. But um, we'll try and get those two people. I'll perhaps send out a message and see who wants one or uh, multiple, and uh, then we'll try and get them round to people, I'll try and deliver them, or maybe somebody in the church will deliver them to you. Okay, so if I let you know about that to the parents, may send out a message later and see who, uh, who would like to take one. So make sure that. Uh, they're distributed uh, fairly amongst, uh, amongst the church. Let's pray together. We're going to uh, look at Haggai chapter 2 for the penultimate time. And um, let's just bring what we're going to do before the Lord. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do pray for this time together as we look at your words, as we think about these words that we thought about already. Words we're hopefully now familiar with as we've read these together on a number of occasions. And this uh, situation, which was perhaps, perhaps a couple of months ago, was very strange to us and distant and unusual and mysterious and now perhaps more familiar. And we have a better grasp of what's going on. But also, Lord, we pray we'd have a better grasp of how you want to deal with us today. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't want to speak for a short time this morning. I'm, I'm never quite sure how long it's going to be I plan to speak. But the plan is this, we'll just speak for a shorter time. Uh, so we're always going to look at these things together with the things that we're going to look at next week, trying to bundle them together. But um, we're just going to focus on this idea of the earth shaking that is mentioned twice in Haggai chapter 2. Now some of you have lived in other parts of this country. Some of you have lived in other parts of the world as well. But... If you were living in this part of the country on September the 23rd in the year 2000, so nearly 21 years ago, and if you were awake between 12 midnight and 1am in the morning, it would have been a night to remember. If anybody knows why, something happens in this part of the world that almost never happens in this part of the world. It started about eight miles below the surface in the West Midlands, and it gradually came to the surface. Does anybody know what it was? Does anybody remember it? Steve, do you remember it? It was an earthquake, yes. Anybody remember that? 21 years ago, maybe some of you uh, will have done, uh, if you had the... Uh, if you had a sleepless night that night, 20, uh, 21 years ago. Let me ask the children a question, see if they know the answer to this. I, I, I'd be very impressed if you do, but I know we've got some intelligent children. How do you measure an earthquake? Because you can measure it, because not all earthquakes are the same, are they? Yes, some terrifying earthquakes are some just little tremors. How do you measure an earthquake, do you know? Stephanie, do you know? Sorry, let me say again. Yes, yes, that's right, they, they measure how much it how much the ground moves. Do you know what they call that? Right, did you have your hand up? On the Richter scale, that's what they call it. Yeah, that scale of how much things move. It's called the Richter scale. Probably named after something called Mr. Richter, I imagine. I don't really know. But yes, the Richter scale. And um, the earthquake that we had 21 years ago was very small. It was a uh, 4.8 on the Richter scale. I think it goes an awful lot higher than that. There were a few windows smashed, a few car alarms went off. But nobody was seriously hurt. So we, how do you measure the earthquake? What, what's the instrument called? Do you know what the Richter scale is measured on? It's called a seismograph. But we can even show you one of those, just put it on the screen. Now that's the idea, isn't it? When you have that little needle there and, and the earthquake, it, it sort of moves it and how much it moves is the size of the, uh, size of the earthquake. But well, we don't have big earthquakes here when we actually have them. But a year later, a year after that, is an event that people certainly will remember. Wherever you're living on planet Earth, you will remember this event on the 11th of September 2001, 12 months later. There was an event that shook the world in a very different way. It wasn't an earthquake, was it? No, the ground did shake. The devastating attack in New York City was an earth-shaking event. 
9-11 shook the world. You couldn't measure that on a Richter, Richter scale, could you? You couldn't measure it with a seismograph. It wasn't that kind of shaking. 9-11 shook people's hearts, didn't it? It shook people's lives and families and shook businesses and nations. It shook people's trust and their confidence. And in some ways, the world hasn't been the same since. I've tried to fly around the world since then, you'll know that it's been different. In Haggai chapter 2, we have an event like that. See, twice God speaks about shaking the heavens and the earth. So he's not speaking about an earthquake. Not something you can measure on a Richter scale or with a size of graph. God speaks about an event that would be off the charts, unmeasurable. The whole of creation shaking. Just read about it in verses 6 and 7, where God says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And in verse 21, God says it twice in this chapter, beginning and the end. Verse 21, God says to Zerubbabel, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. So think about this. Morning. What's this shaking about? What's God talking about when he says that he's going to shake things? Well, we don't have to guess because God explains it to us. Twice he says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And then twice, immediately after, God explains what that means. So in verse 6 and 7, I'll shake the heavens and the earth. I'll shake the sea and the dry lands. Then he explains it. I'll shake all the nations. That, that's what he means by that. Verse 21, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And immediately explains afterwards, what was this shaking all about? I will overturn royal thrones, shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. It's about shaking nations and rulers and empires and kingdoms. You know, a number of kingdoms in that day had attacked and um, oppressed and enslaved God's people. And God says to his people, don't worry, those kingdoms will be shaken. They'll come crashing down, they'll tumble and crumble to the ground. So that's what God is saying here. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'm going to shake nations. I'm going to shake these people who have attacked and oppressed and committed wicked deeds. But listen to the way God says it, because he uses special language to describe this shaking. He says, once more I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Do you recognise that kind of language in the Bible? That's creation language. Back to Genesis chapter 1, the opening chapter of the Bible, where God describes the creation of the world. And how does he describe it? Describe, describes creating the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. You remember that back in Genesis 1? Here we have the same language here. Heavens and earth, sea and dry land. So creation is all about God making things. He makes the heavens, he makes the earth, he makes the sea, he makes the dry land. But here, God says the opposite of creation is going to happen. The things that God has made, heavens and earth, sea and dry land, they're going to shake, they're going to fall, they're going to come tumbling down. In other words, I've created these things, but they're going to become uncreated. They'll be unmade, they'll be undone. It's a reversal of what happened in creation. It's an uncreation. So you see what happened, what's happening here? God is talking about the collapse the destruction of kingdoms and nations. But he speaks about it like the collapse of creation, of the world coming down. There are other examples in the Bible of God using this kind of language, where he talks about a kingdom that's going to come to an end, and he describes it like creation coming to an end, like the world coming crashing down. So, for example, Isaiah chapter 13. I'll give you two examples. Isaiah 13. God talks about the destruction of Babylon, that great empire that would come to an end. And God describes it like this. He describes it like the world coming down. He says the stars in heaven, the constellation will not give their light. The rising sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth shake. So God describes the fall of Babylon, but he describes it like the falling down of the entire world. Remember, the creation account speaks of 
The lights in the sky, God made the sun, moon and stars to govern the days and the nights. But here's in the fall of Babylon, it will be like the sun, moon and stars stop shining. Their time will come to an end. The sun will stop shining on their kingdom. Their rulers will come crashing down. Another example, in Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was uh, destroyed by plague and famine, Joel describes it in the Old Testament. In Joel chapter 2, he says, The earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, the stars no longer shine. That's what it will be like. It's like the world has come crashing down. So we have this image in the Bible. God is creator. God is the maker. He builds things. He creates the earth and the heavens, the sea, the dry land, the sun, the moon, the stars. God is the, the maker of things, but sin causes things to be unmade. It causes things to be uncreated. It undoes what God has done. God makes things, sin causes things to be unmade. And he speaks about these nations and these kingdoms who committed great wicked acts, being destroyed by their own sin. God describes it like them being uncreated and unmade. So when Babylon and Jerusalem fall, it was like their world had come crashing down. The sun and moon stopped shining on their kingdom. Everything was being, everything that God had built was being unbuilt now. Over the last 12 months, our world has been shaken, hasn't it? Perhaps in a way that it, it hasn't been shaken before. In a way that everybody has come under the same set of circumstances at the same time. Right? Everywhere you go to any country around the world, and they're all asking the same questions, and they're all facing this same issue. Great issues of the past have affected a part of the world, but this is something that has been universal in a way that other things haven't. Our world has been shaken. Different areas of life have been shaken. Well, all areas of life, really. Your work has been shaken. You've got a job. Well, that's changed, hasn't it? Schools have been shaken. You've got kids at school. Well, that's changed. Family. Exercise. Businesses. The economy. Church. Shops. Everything from that to our plans for the future. Governments have been shaken. Travelling across the world has been shaken. Our health has been shaken, perhaps, many of us. Hospitals, our healthcare. The world has been shaken, and some parts of this world have come crashing down. Now, it's been about a year since this world was shaken, and I think we need to start asking some questions of ourselves. I mean, close to the anniversary of when those lockdown measures came in, I think we need to start asking ourselves the question about how we're getting on as people. We want to reflect on this this morning and perhaps for the rest of the day. Think of, how are you getting on? Are you coping okay? Are you holding up under the strain of these lockdown measures and these restrictions on our lives? Are you scraping through each day? Or are you being shaken? So lots of us have been shaken, haven't we? You know, sometimes we need to get really honest with ourselves, honest with God and honest with each other. Some of us perhaps come to church each week, we smile, we dress up nice, smile, clean, cl clean clothes, and people ask us how we're doing, and we say, yeah, we're doing okay. But a lot of us are not doing okay, are we? Some of us put a brave face on it, but inside, deep down, our worlds have been shaken, and we're not okay. We need to be honest, and we need to admit where we are at, as people. We need to be honest with ourselves, we need to be honest with God who knows all things, sometimes we need to be honest with each other as well. And I know that some of you will be really struggling at the moment. Different things, different areas of life may change. Some of you have, some of you have lost loved ones over the past 12 months, some of you are grieving. Some of you will be struggling mentally, there will be worries and anxieties, there will be fears. Some of you may be struggling with sadnesses and depression. Some of you may be feeling trapped and stuck in a particular part of your life where you can't move forward because of what's happened. Some of you may just be so low. You don't know what to do. Your, your joys run out and your, 
your hope seems, seems like it's gone. Some of you may just be fed up. 12 months of this, how much longer? Some of you just tired of it all. Perhaps for some of you, your marriages may have suffered. Maybe you've caused your partner heartache. You haven't been very easy to live with over the past 12 months, maybe. Some of you may feel that you've failed as parents. Kids have driven you up the wall. They're 24 7, can't send them off to school, perhaps. Perhaps you've lost your patience with your children. Perhaps some of you have lost your temper with your children. Perhaps some of you feel at your wit's end. Maybe for some of you, you wish you had children. You wish you had a partner. You wish you had a family, but you're just so desperately lonely. You don't really know what to do. Maybe some of you are at an all-time low in life. I suspect that many of you may have struggled spiritually as well. Struggling one part of life, you'll be struggling spiritually. You struggle spiritually, and it will affect other parts of life. Maybe for some of you, your love for God has run dry. Your love for other Christians has run dry, maybe. Temptation is getting the better of you too easily. You've got no joy in the Lord, no desire to pray or to read his word or to meet with other Christians. If you've not struggled with any of those things and you think, well, I don't know what you're talking about this morning, I'm absolutely fine, then please speak to me later and you can tell me your secret of how you've managed to cope. Maybe some of us are too proud to admit it, or maybe some of us are even too cowardly to admit it. They're actually we're really struggling at the moment, and we need to come clean. And we need to be honest with ourselves, and honest with God, and say maybe even honest with each other, and say, look, I'm really finding it hard at the moment, and I need help. My world's been shaken, and I'm struggling, struggling with the Lord, struggling at home, I'm struggling at work, and I don't really know what to do. If that describes you this morning, and I suspect it may describe quite a lot of people this morning, then you need to know that you're not alone. That's important. God did not desire you to be alone. He said, it's not good for a man to be alone. God put us together so that we can go through things together. To know that we're not alone because we're with the Lord and we're with his people. He saved us to be part of community and family. There's someone in the church you really trust, and I say to you, you perhaps need to send them a message later on if you're struggling. Perhaps call them later and say, look, will you pray for me? Maybe you're brave enough and bold enough to say what it is you're struggling with in a particular area of life. Maybe um, you just want to say, look, just, just pray for me at the moment. I'm really alone with how things have gone. I really want to find more joy in the Lord. If you want to speak to me later, Please feel free to do that. Just want to send me a message just saying, please pray for me, pray for my family, or perhaps you know somebody who's struggling. Please just pray for us at the moment. You don't have to put a brave face on it. You don't have to pretend everything's okay. You can, you can know that actually we're all struggling. If you're struggling, I'm struggling, we can talk to each other about it. We can pray for each other. You don't have to speak to me. I'll speak to one of the leaders of the church. Send them a message, phone them up. You know, the leaders of this church, they're good people. I've lost count of the amount of times we've met over the last 12 months, but they really care for you. And they really care for your lives. And they'd love to be able to support you and love you better. Some of you are not leaders of this church, and perhaps you think it's time for me to step up because there are people in this church who are struggling, and I can help them. I can support them. Ultimately, I don't have all the answers. But I know a man who does. I can commend him to you this morning. There's an old Christian song that says this. Christ is the answer to my every need. Are you suffering this morning? Well, Jesus became known as the man of sorrows. The man of suffering. He was known by the amount he suffered. No one suffered quite like Jesus. Are you suffering mentally this morning? Are you low? Are you sad? Are you depressed? Imagine the mental suffering Jesus went through for us. He once said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. The sadness is so severe, I feel like it could end my life, he said. Imagine that mental pain of knowing what you would endure on that cross. Most people don't know the day of their death, do they? Jesus knew it. 
and all eternity he knew it. He went to that cross, he prepared for it, knowing that all his friends would reject him, he'd go to that cross alone, and not only suffer that physical torture, but also the, the spiritual and mental weight of the sin of the world. If you're suffering physically at the moment, just think of what Jesus endured for you on that cross. Suffering spiritually, remember that Jesus took every sin on himself, he became the curse for us. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, the Bible says. And on that cross, do you know what it says in the Bible? It says it went dark. The sun stopped shining. Recognise that language? That's that, that's that destruction language, isn't it, in the Old Testament? Where kingdoms came crashing down and it was like the sun stopped shining and, and the moon refused to give its light. And you know what it says? As Jesus was destroyed by our sin... Like kingdoms and nations were destroyed in Old Testament, Jesus is destroyed by sin. Matthew then tells us that as Jesus, his body is destroyed on the cross and he breathes his last, it says the earth shook. Jesus was shaken. You know, sometimes we can find it hard to understand. What do these Old Testament passages mean? Here's all these passages in the Old Testament are about nations being judged and shaken and, and destroyed and coming to ruin and Haggai tells of these nations shaking and collapsing and, and, and you think, well, well, what's this got to do with me? Well, what am I supposed to understand? Why should I be interested in these things? Well, it's got everything to do with you and you should really be interested because Haggai says these are the effects of sin. Sin destroys things, it unmakes things, it undoes things. And the Bible says all have sinned. We've sinned. He's describing the effects of sin and we've sinned. So the destruction that you read about, the destruction that came on Babylon or Assyria or Jerusalem or different parts of the world, the destruction that came on them because of sin, well, I'm a sinner as well. It's telling us what, what happens to sinful people. It tells us where sin is taking us, the consequences of sin. But on the cross we're told Jesus takes those consequences. He takes the destruction, he's shaken. He's cursed, he's condemned, he's destroyed. The destruction that should fall on us and nations and kingdoms and rulers falls on Jesus instead. So at the death of Jesus, there's an earthquake. The world shook. Three days later, the world shook again, didn't it? Matthew 28 tells us this. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven Going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. This time the earth shook because the world was being turned upside down. Death became life. Defeat became victory. Night became morning. And despair became eternal hope. If you're a Christian, your life is built on an earthquake. It's built on the resurrection. Where the ground shook and the world was turned upside down. It was shook in the ultimate sense. Your life is built on the earth-shaking events of the resurrection of Jesus. You can't be a Christian unless your world has been shaken. You can't be a Christian unless your world has been turned upside down. It may not look quite so dramatic as that. But it's like night and day. Knowing Jesus and not knowing him. Knowing the resurrection, knowing eternal life. And not knowing it. If your life is built on Jesus, it's built on a foundation that cannot be shaken. In fact, Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost. You remember? To these crowds of people in Jerusalem. And he says, God raised Jesus from the death, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. Then he says, David spoke about that. David said, the Lord is always by my side. And because he's with me, I cannot be shaken. There's no firmer ground. Than standing with Jesus, standing on the rock that is his resurrection. What can shake you as a Christian ultimately? Can you shake by suffering or death or rejection or pain? If you're standing on Jesus, you're standing on someone who, who suffered and he was rejected and ultimately he died, yet came back to life in victory and you stand on him. He just mentioned, we're just going to close, he just to mention um, how these verses are used in the New Testament. Because these verses are quoted in the book of Hebrews that we read together in January, at the beginning of the year, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 26. It quotes Haggai chapter 2. He says, um, 
At that time, God's voice shook the earth. We've been talking about, perhaps I need to say something, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments. Remember, Moses goes up the mountain, have the Ten Commandments, and the ground shook. He's been talking about that in Hebrews 12. And he says, at that time, God's voice shook the earth. Now, Haggai, when he, in chapter 2, he says, once more I will shake the earth. You say, well, what was the first time then? Well, I think he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Moses of the mountain and the earth shake. Once more, God's going to shake the earth. Hebrews quotes, he says, but now God has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens from Haggai. And then the author to the Hebrews explains, says, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken will remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. God says he's going to shake the created things so that what is eternal, what is uncreated will remain. You know, sometimes we need our world to be shaken. You know the story about John Newton? Very powerful story about John Newton. The, uh, he was a wicked man, slave trader. And he did awful things as a slave trader as well. He was a master of a captain of a slave ship. Stuck in his sin and his wickedness. But he had a dramatic encounter. His world was shaken. Over a number of years, his, there was a great event where his, his ship was, he was nearly shipwrecked. Where his ship nearly sank and he's nearly killed. And he suddenly came to grips with the fact, I'm going to have to stand before my maker. His world was shaken. What about the life I've lived? The wicked things I've done to these poor innocent slaves. And over a number of years, he was confronted with his sin. His world was shaken. And he came to Jesus and he wrote that amazing song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Sometimes we need our world to be shaken so that we can make sure that what we're standing on is solid rock. Hebrews says, if you're putting your trust in Jesus, you're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and therefore let us be thankful. So what we're going to do, we're going to be thankful this morning, we're going to respond to his song. Dale's going to play as a song in reflection, the closing song I've chosen because it has these words in it. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head on the cross. This is the power of the cross, that Christ became sin for us. He took the blame. He took the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. We pray for us that we'll stand as we reflect on this word. Lord Jesus, we thank you. So though sin has a shaking effect upon our lives, although suffering and struggle has a shaking effect on this world at the moment, Lord, we thank you that we have put our trust in something that cannot be shaken, on solid rock, because the one we are trusting in was shaken on the cross. He experienced that destruction that was due to our name and our account. And he rose to new life with an earthquake. That our world has been shaken as a result. And that what, is, um, what can be shaken has been done away with. And what is eternal will remain. That we may receive something that is unshakable. And be thankful in it. In Jesus' name we give our thanks. Amen.
reading some of those words that we read at the beginning from Psalm 62 say, Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is a mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge.